season of Lent, uh, certainly not every church uh, embraces what we call the church here with its different seasons. And for some of us, Lent itself um, may not be a word or a particular experience that we have deep connections to. Um, our hope in our prayer, kind of what Chris mentioned as we journey through together, is that this season, these 40 days before Easter, would be a time for Jesus' church, us, to reflect, to rejoice and celebrate at the, the resurrection of Jesus for sure, but also to be perhaps a, a little more sensitive uh, to areas in our life together in our lives individually, where God is convicting and moving in perhaps there's repentance that's needed. That cycle, essentially, is in order to live, we die, right? Uh, Good Friday is followed by Easter. That Jesus has set this pattern out all throughout Scripture. uh, That unless a seed falls to the ground and dies, it has no life in it. But when it does die, that's when the life sprouts out. And so this whole death and resurrection cycle, it is the Christian story. And so our season of Lent, that while not every church embraces it, certainly many do, um, is an extended season of considering, pondering, repenting, so that we as a church and as individuals can find ourselves at the foot of the cross come Good Friday to wait for a wonderful Easter morning to come. So our season of Lent tends to be uh, I don't know if more somber is the right right word, but more intentionally pensive, uh, perhaps, than other times in the church year. Uh, we have a life together as uh, FCCB. Um, it's interesting. Uh, I think quite a bit, actually, about God's kingdom around the world. Um, oftentimes on Sunday when I'm in prayer, my mind is just drifting where Uh, Churches in Asia, all across Europe and Africa, have already risen to worship the Savior. And I just kind of join that stream of Jesus' people. And so we have an identity as part of God's family, his worldwide family, his family that has existed since the beginning of creation all the way through today. Like, it's a large family. We also have an identity, perhaps more locally, um, We pray often for the journey and be free in particular that somehow God has placed our three churches together in this community and that that's meaningful for us, that the place God has put us uh, is not haphazard, but he's put us here so that men might reach out and women might reach out and find God because they find one of us. And so the journey matters to us and be free matters to us in Barrington. We're part of Barrington's church. We also have this identity that's FCCB, us. We have a unique culture, unique DNA characteristic. There's certain things about us that probably those descriptions wouldn't apply to many other churches. Uh, Same thing in reverse. Descriptions of many other churches probably are not descriptive of of us. That God has made us unique. Group of people uh, gathering together. Uh, to worship him. We also carry this identity even a bit smaller, right? That when we're traveling for work and we're sitting on an airplane, I have an identity as part of God's people as I'm living an individual life out there. As I stop into the grocery store, as my grandkids get dropped off, as I'm clocking in to work, as I'm paying my taxes, this individual life that Scott has and that you have around is also reflective of my identity as part of Jesus' church. I don't have an individual identity that's apart from my identity with you guys, his church. We call that uh, the gathered church. So there's a lot of work that goes into the gathered church. Um, I don't thank people often enough for the experience uh, that's put together. Nothing ever happens without somebody making it happen. We can lose sight of that sometimes. 
things as simple as uh, the menorah up here. Um, this is not something FCCB typically has up front. But as we read through the letters to the seven churches, Jesus uses this as the backdrop that there's seven lampstands. And he most certainly is thinking about the menorah, the lampstand in front of the, the temple. That would have looked like this. So we light it up. As simple as finding a menorah, someone had to do that. And, and I am really thankful for uh, the team uh, that helps set up Lent. Uh, we have ministry teams scattered in different areas. Uh, they're all doing amazing things. Lent, uh, a lot of it has come from uh, Elizabeth and uh, Jeff and Karen um, and Chris gathering together, working through this. And I'm just thankful, guys, uh, for the thought beforehand. And you can thank our AV team and worship team. Uh, they spent their day here yesterday re rewiring uh, trying new things, putting new systems in that you and I would never know, right? We just enjoy the blessings of what you guys give us, but we're thankful for the backdrop, the energy, uh, the time that you guys put in. We are a gathered church for sure, but the majority of our life, right, is not the gathered church. It's the scattered church. The 90-some-odd percent of my life is not with you, it's out there somewhere. It's living life, it's working, it's earning a paycheck, it's visiting family, it's going on trips, it's out there apart. We call it the scattered church. Uh, The word we use for that is your 110. So we've kind of done the the math along the way, and we said if you take sleeping hours out, uh, you take... Five to seven hours, maybe a week that you're in a Bible study or here at church, you take that out. We're left with about 110 hours scattered, more or less alone, apart from the church. That in those 110, we have significant opportunities to be Jesus' disciple. But whether we're apart or whether we're together, we have a DNA, a culture, uh, shared values, expectations. We have a name characteristics. You ever wonder what those are? You ever wonder what what is our identity as FCCB? <clears throat> what do we like? What do we like? Is our life together, as well as our scattered life out in Stratford County, is it pleasing to the Lord or is it not? Where do we struggle where are our strengths and where are our weaknesses? And, and that can be a really difficult question, right? That can be really hard. Um, it's hard to know what you are like. And I'm going to give you an example as a way uh, down south, which is a completely different culture, for some training uh, this week. And my takeaway was... Uh, don't be weird, right? Literally, that's my summary. I'm like, can I summarize these three days with don't be weird? And the, the instructor was like, yeah, that pretty much summarizes it. And my first thought was, well, good, I got that covered, right? I'm not weird. Am I, honey? Right? <laughs> I had that moment of, wait, in my world, I'm not weird, but how does that come across to others and when your wife tries on a new dress right and all the husbands are like "Uh, here it comes when your wife tries on a new dress what is the typical question that we have to field one way or another Uh, you can spend years training for this one moment and you're still going to blow it Uh, the question is right honey does this Make me look fat. All right. So wives, just put yourselves in your husband's place in that moment just for a second and empathize with us. We have no good answer. There is no proper answer to that question. All right. And so we pause. We have the deer in the headlight. We say our quick prayer of, God, if you help me in this moment, I'll serve you forever. 
and we spit out some answer. But, but I think actually behind that question of wives asking what they look like is the authenticity of it's hard to know. Like, actually, does that make you look less healthy and trim than you truly are, my dear? I think uh, e- even in that, that fun little scenario, um, is that that reality that it is so hard to self-reflect. It is so hard to see ourselves as we really are. And that's true not only on the bad side, right? Am I weird? Um, which I'm not looking for you to reflect on that after the service, okay? You can hold that to yourself. Uh, it's not just on the, the negative side of, uh, oh, I don't know if I'm too angry, too bitter, uh, too caustic. But it's also on the good side. Isn't it hard to recognize good things in your life? Like, really, embrace them. That you may think that you have a humility that, that's godly before the Lord, and yet it's hard to claim that. It's hard to look at your life and say, yeah, I'm humble, because all of a sudden you're like, well, that doesn't feel humble to say that. And then, you, at least I, I'm going to use the first person singular pronoun, because maybe this doesn't happen to you. But I, I find myself in this cycle, this battle of it's hard to claim something even that's good about my life authentically, to know it, to own it. Uh, it could be an obedience thing, that you've walked faithfully with the Lord in a certain area, and yet in the back door comes this like negative, well, you're not perfect, you know that, you're a sinner. And those things are true, and yet that good thing ought to describe you. It's just hard. It's hard on both sides. It's hard on the good characteristics as well as uh, the bad ones. So what is God's perspective? What would he say to us, if anything? That's why we're turning to Revelation chapter 2 and 3. I want to invite you to turn to to Revelation 2. Uh, We're going to hear the letter read in just a moment, and, and I believe we have the projection. Uh, that'll come up, but we'll be in Revelation 2, beginning in verse 12. Because I want us, as a church, I need me as pastor of the church. I need us, I want us, to hear the authentic encouragement that's coming from an outside source, that's also in and among us, that from the Lord Jesus, he would speak to us to breathe life into the good things. To say, well done, guys. Uh, I see it. You ought to be encouraged. I have some good heavenly rewards for you. I want us to hear some of the encouragement that ought to be ours to embrace from Jesus. But I also really value the opportunity to hear the admonishments. Those areas that we've gotten off track. Those areas that we embrace sinfulness. Uh, those areas that, that we need repentance of as a church. Those are hard to see. They're very difficult to see. And so we are relying on the Lord's discernment. And so this is kind of how it, it works. At least in my mind. As we receive this letter, my job is not to discern what applies to us and what doesn't. I will make comments along the way about my opinion, but that discernment thing is ours. It's us. These letters are written to groups of people. They're given to the angel of the church to read or to pass along to the churches themselves But that discernment thing is ours. That we would embrace, oh Lord, can we rejoice at your commendation here? Is this something that describes FCCB? Can we celebrate this moment? Or ought we not to? And in the same way, together in discernment, to ask, Lord, are you 
Are you giving us this difficult word? Are you calling us to repentance over this reprimand? Is this ours to own that we need to, as a community, go on our knees to repent before you? That's a together thing. It's not me dictating out to you which of these things are ours. Okay? Um, I hope that makes sense. Fortunately, right, we have the Holy Spirit to help us along. (laughs) Because there's a lot that Jesus is giving to his church. We have the Holy Spirit helping to interpret his word. Uh, Each one of these letters, we're in the third one this morning. Each one of these letters are written to the angel of the particular church. Um, And that phraseology that we see here, um, it, it just pops in my mind. Like these are little kingdom outposts in Asia Minor, part of Turkey now. These, these are little uh, forts on the front line as the kingdom is advancing. There's a little church in Pergamum. And that the commander-in-chief, the lord of the army, has a message to give to the troops out there because there's some amazing things that are going on, but there's also some things that are not amazing. And so the commander-in-chief like gets his corporal uh, in charge of the troops out there, the angel, who's like, Get this message to the corporal. The troops need to hear this. And so we're going to hear uh, each week. The letters are written to the angel. And it just sets it in an importance level where this is not convenience, right? This is not us on our couch in our living room with our Apple TV, a surfing March Madness to find the game we want when, hey, in comes a letter. And it's just on the table until we're done with that and we cook supper and we're cleaning and finally someone sees it and says, yeah, we probably ought to open that. And it's just a comfort letter. That's not what these are. These are the corporal grabbing it as quick as it comes, opening it, and then summoning all the troops immediately to hear the message. Because it's important. There's a battle going on for these churches. All right. That kind of sets our scene here uh, for Revelation uh, chapter 2, beginning verse 12. Death. To the angel of the church in Pergamum, right? These are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city, where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore. Otherwise, I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. All right. Uh, We're going to do something with this letter uh, to the church in Pergamum, a bit different than most of the other letters. Because there's a whole lot that we don't understand at that first hearing, right? Um, some people along the way have said scripture is simple. Uh, I disagree. Uh, so scripture is not simple. The message is simple. Uh, God loves you and he's made a way through Jesus for us to be back uh, with our father. That message is a simple message, but the scripture is not simple. Uh, There's lots of scholarship that has to go into 
helping us understand it. And this letter is one of them. I don't think there's a single verse in here that we're like, yeah, I got that one. I think every verse has just this layer that we have to unpack to even understand what Jesus is saying in this letter before we can ever discern whether these things are ours. And not every letter is like this. This letter happens to be packed full. So what we'll do today is work through the letter, try to, uh, best we can, get an understanding of what's being written, and then go back and have that time of reflection. Okay? Uh, so verse 12, Revelation 2. The letter's coming to the, the church in Pergamum. He says, these are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. Um, I don't play around with swords much. I, that's one of the things when I was a boy. Um, I just embraced that teaching. I've never let go. Like, Scott, stop playing with swords. It's not safe to run around the house with swords. And so... I just kind of embrace that, and I don't really play with swords, but some of you do. I know you do. I've seen you play with your swords in your houses. Uh, if there's uh, anyone that wants to uh, do harm to some of our church members at their home, uh, you ought to come to me first, because I'll tell you which homes to avoid. All right? There are some homes you do not want to mess with, and uh, some of you literally have swords uh, in your home. Uh, this is a picture uh, of a probably three, two and a half to three foot sword, not, not a dagger, but a long sword that's sharp on both sides. And so there's an obvious functional purpose to this, which we probably get right away. Um, if I have a double-edged sword, I can just swing that around like mad, right? I don't even need a good plan. All I have to do is get that thing moving any which way, and it's going to put a hurt on some people. There, there's a functional aspect of battle that comes uh, with the sword. Uh, it can pierce. Uh, certainly would be a good weapon in war. Uh, God elsewhere uses this image of a double-edged sword that his word divides soul and spirit. Like it's a cutting device, this sword. But there's also this symbolic piece that, that we wouldn't get at first glance. Uh, back in the, these days in the Roman Empire where these churches were, the double-edged sword was given only to one person. And so there's no soldier on the field that had a double-edged sword. There's one person. It was the ruler, the emperor, the governor of a region, okay? So if you had command, if you had authority over a large region, one of the symbols that you would have of that authority is your double-edged sword. The reason is because in the Roman Empire, there were some in authority, and it was high up, but there were some in authority that had the right, even the responsibility to declare life or death. So if you were one of the rulers in the Roman Empire who had a double-edged sword, it indicated you, by yourself, could issue capital punishment. A crime comes to you, you serve as the jury, the judge, and the executioner. It's a way of saying, I, myself, Hold the power of your life or death in my hands. It's why only a a few rulers in the empire would have it, because the lower guys didn't have that authority. But there are some who did. And the ruler over this region, where Pergamum was, he had his double-edged sword. That if the ruler around Pergamum from Rome declared that you deserve death, you would die. Or, on the other hand, that ruler could declare by the authority that's represented in this double-edged sword that you are pardoned, that your life is spared. He literally held your life in the power of his hands. And here comes Jesus, right? 
writing this letter saying, he may have one of these swords, but there is one above all rulers, above all swords, above all authority, and it's me. And Jesus is encouraging this church in Pergamum that there is no one that holds life or death outside of my authority. That his authority is above all else. And so while they may kill the body, they will never destroy your soul. And one day, we know the story goes, all will be put back together through the resurrection of the faithful to have life eternal, body and soul restored. And so Jesus makes this claim in his introduction. The letter goes on. These are the words of him who has a sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who is put to death in your city where Satan lives. And two times in this verse, Satan is both named and his location given. I mean, that's unique, right? We don't see this kind of verbiage often anywhere in the Scripture. That if someone were to ask you, uh, if you were a resident of Pergamum, um, Hey, yeah, so where do you come from? You know, do you want to do some trade? What what city do you belong to? Well, I belong to Satan's city. I live uh, right next door to his throne. I mean, it's like around the corner, but essentially it's right next door to Satan's throne. And, and just even that imagery is like, wait, what? Now, what is Jesus even referencing here? Here's a couple of thoughts. This city, Pergamum, at a minimum, is identified as central to Satan's kingdom advancing. There's something about Pergamum, unlike the other churches, the other six churches, there's something about Pergamum that is pivotal to Satan's plans advancing against the church. That the opposition is somehow intense around Pergamum. So much so that Jesus can identify it as the place of Satan's throne and as the place where Satan lives. And Pergamum, from all sorts of of sources, uh, we know that there were lots and lots of gods honored there with temples scattered all throughout the city. But the one thing that stands out about Pergamum was that there were fiercely loyal to the emperor of Rome. The other cities were part of the Roman Empire, but they were not fiercely loyal like Pergamum was, and there's a reason for it. The reason is because they had the second greatest collection of books, library. (coughs) Um, I've always uh, wondered, when I say ancient library, probably most of us think Alexandria, I've always wondered, like ever since a little kid, like what did that look like? What did it take to get a library card from that library? I mean, these aren't even books, right? They're on parchments. They're on uh, papyrus. They're, they're on something. They're scrolls. It must have been stunning. But when the Roman Empire marched in to Pergamum, to this area, they found their massive library, which was the second biggest one in the world, and they ransacked it took all of it back to Alexandria, to to their library. And as history rolls on, just a few decades later, um, it's it's interesting. It's a story that has names we're familiar with, like Mark Antony, right? Um, the, The Caesar at the time came back to Pergamum and gave back their resources. So you can imagine their city was grateful now to Rome. Uh, The new emperor has established relationships, so when the leader of Pergamum died, uh, he did what I've never seen in my brief knowledge of history. He willed the city to the Roman Empire. Literally, 
that he had the authority as he's dying in his will to give the city of Pergamum to the Roman Empire as a way of saying thank you. And so that legacy was only maybe 40, 50 years before these letters are written. If Revelation has a later date, as some suspect, at the most it would be 100 years before this donation had happened. So they're fiercely loyal to the Roman Empire. And so what the citizens of Pergamum did, they were the very first city to prove their loyalty to Rome. Um, They wanted evidence to be shown of this loyalty. And so they built the very first temple in Asia dedicated to emperor worship. You could go anywhere else. You could go to Sardis. You could go to Ephesus. You are not going to find what you would find in Pergamum. A massive temple to Caesar. And here's the, the requirement. Every resident of Pergamum, several times a year, was required to go to the temple of Caesar, bend down on one knee, perhaps two, and utter the words, Caesar is Lord. And once they made that declaration, they would get their paperwork that they're faithful to the Caesar. They could go back and worship any god they wanted or no god at all. It didn't matter. As long as you gave your allegiance to the Caesar, to the ruler. It kind of sets up the scene then, right? Well, if Rome, and ultimately through the years, authority, earthly authority, powers governments, they are the places from which opposition primarily has come. If a church somewhere in the world is being persecuted, it is almost guaranteed it's being persecuted by the governmental authorities within that country. That's kind of how history has come down through the ages. And you can begin to see Jesus is identifying Pergamum as Satan's throne because it's the locale out of which incredible persecution is going to go to the church. From the government authority that does not want this rebellious group worshiping their Lord because Caesar is Lord, they'll be persecuted. It's central to the opposition plans. This clash between... God's community in the world's authority often has been uh, described as two cities. Uh, One of the uh, fathers of our faith, uh, St. Augustine, wrote in the City of God about these two worlds colliding. Because it's always been Satan's strategy for opposing the church all these years. And so the church in Pergamum paid a high price. I want you to to feel this just for a moment. Jesus writes to you, if you're in that church, I know where you live. You do? It's so hard. It's so hard saying faithful Jesus. The threats are all around. You, You recognize this? You see this? I want you to feel both Jesus identifying with these people in their persecution and in the difficult place they are. I want you to feel just a little bit of the church's pain here. Because he speaks about it. Yeah, I know. You didn't renounce your faith in me. Even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Jesus, you knew Auntie? You, you knew his name? As the tears begin to flow down your face because he was your best friend, your children's godfather. He was at every significant event in your kid's life. He was such an up, upstanding part of your church in Pergamum. He was just loved. And you saw him hacked to death. And just in that moment, like when the persecution comes and they haul Antipas out and they say, this is your last chance. Kneel before the temple of Caesar. 
And he looks at you, Antipas does, and you look at him, and you just have this moment, and you know he's not going to do it. And there's a piece of you rejoicing in that, right? He's going to be faithful, and then there's a piece of you so wounded because you know what that's going to mean. And you witness it. And that night, you and so many others from your church are just devastated. You're crying. You're weeping. You're, you're celebrating the faithfulness, but you're just so wounded. And they're going to come after me next. And this is so hard. And here comes Jesus. I know him by name. I know where you live. I know him by name. I know your pain. Thank you for being faithful. I know that was hard. And even in that church holds on to Jesus' name, they kept their faith under even that kind of tremendous personal pressure. Jesus also has other words for him. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold on to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols. And by committing sexual immorality. Now, likewise, you also have those who hold on to the teaching of the uh, Nicolaitans. Alright. So, you probably agree, we need to unpack that a, a little bit, right? Um, I've been listening through the, the scriptures again th- this year. Uh, I just listened, uh, beginning of March, started the journey through the book of Numbers. And when you say the book of Numbers, uh, reality is, for me, is like, oh, no. You know, I just got out of Leviticus, and now I have to go through the book of Numbers. And yet, Numbers is filled with all sorts of stories. Uh, there are indeed lots of, like, genealogies and counting people and tribes and everything. But interspersed with that are amazing stories. And one of them is the donkey talker, right? Balaam. Um, if you know the story, uh, you're just going to have to ride this wave with me. If you don't know the story, welcome to the wave. Um, Balaam was a prophet um, that the king of the Midianites hired. Okay, So Balak is the king. Israel is coming. They're not yet at the promised land, but they're on the way. And The king's little empire is sitting right on the doorstep of the promised land. He knows Israel is coming through. And so he reaches out. He he knows he can't defeat them. He knows the story of how God has uh, supported them, done amazing things for his people. And so Balak, King Balak, makes a phone call to Balaam, the local seer, prophet, guy held up in high esteem. Calls him up, says, you've got to come. Balaam... All through this encounter with Balak seems like a really faithful guy. He's like, I'm not going to curse the Israelites unless God gives me permission. I'm not doing anything against God. If God uh, tells me to bless them, I'm going to bless. Balak says, okay, whatever, just come, I need you. So uh, Balaam makes the trip over. And he meets with Balak three different times. And Balak's like, Curse the Israelites! Come on, do something! I'm paying you good money! And Balaam's like, I told you. I'm not going to do anything against what the Lord tells me. And so he'd go away. He would pray whatever that would have looked like, which I'm sure is not like what you and I are picturing on our knees with our hands folded. I have no idea how Balaam was praying to his gods because he was not one of God's followers. And yet he reaches out. Every time he receives a blessing and he utters a blessing over Israel. And Balak is furious, right? This isn't what I called you here for. And the scene leaves on Mount Peor. is the last time we see Balaam with Balak. He looks out over the nation of Israel. He offers a blessing over them. And then he walks off the stage. And he seems like a good guy. Other than that whole episode with the talking donkey. He seems like a pretty good guy. And then you're left. Every other time in Scripture Balaam is mentioned, it's awful. He's a horrible guy. 
And until you wrap your head around this one piece, it's hard to understand. Thousands of years later, in the book of Revelation, he's brought up again. Because on that same mount, Mount Peor, where he offered that verbal blessing over Israel and fired King Balak up. It's also just two chapters later where the Moabites sent some of their temple prostitutes into the Israelite encampment to seduce the Israel men, both for sexual immorality as well as to entice the Israelites to worship their gods. 24,000 Israelites were killed by God because of that. You know where that all happened? One or two chapters later in Numbers? Peor. Because later in Numbers, when Balaam is killed by the sword, it specifically says... Because he enticed the Israelites with the Moabite women. And all of a sudden you get the picture that's not in the narrative. It's just beyond the narrative of, hey, King Balak, you paid me good money to curse these guys. I can't. God's not letting me. I've got to bless them. I've got... But here's something you might want to think about. Instead of the frontal assault, Let's try the back door. Send some of the Moabite women. I've seen them. That'll work. Send them in to the camp. And that way, if we can get some of their men to commit sexual idolatry and begin worshiping some God other than Yahweh, do you know what Yahweh's going to do? He's going to take them out. And it was Balaam's plan all along behind that, that later verses make it really clear. We just don't see the dialogue. But Balaam bears the brunt of what happened at Peor all the way through Scripture, even into Revelation. That he seduced God's people with worship and sexual immorality. Which is interesting because those are the two things that are talked about here. Eating meat. Uh, to an idol is worship and uh, sexual immorality. And then the, this other group of teachers is just kind of lumped in uh, with the Balaamites, uh, the Nicolaitans. They had the, the same purpose, uh, to veer off faithful teaching, to open the door uh, to some things that God had not given permission to, to tell the church that they had permission to pursue them. So in verse 16, we come to the prescription where Jesus tells his troops, repent, therefore. Turn, turn from and embrace something new. Head in a new direction. Receive forgiveness and then embrace a new life. Repent, therefore. Otherwise, I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of of my mouth. Feel that? Did you feel that turn right in that moment? This double-edged sword that we see coming out of Jesus' mouth in chapter 1 is where we first see the image. Instead of authority over all the authorities and battle against the enemies, you just feel that in that moment. If you don't repent over these things, I will battle against them with my sword. And he finishes up, as all the letters do, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And that's our prayer all the way through Lent. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. And even at the end, in the promise, is like, what? Hidden manna and white stones, what is that? All I can do is give you my best interpretation. There are, um, there's lots of ideas out there. My best interpretation of what Jesus is promising here, and then I want to summarize something. My best 
interpretation is the hidden manna is Aaron collected some of the manna. So manna is how God provided for his people in the desert, right? I have no food. Oh, Moses, you took us out of Egypt. At least we had food there. Yeah, they beat us and we were slaves and we hated it. And we called out to God and they're killing our babies. And But at least we had food out here in the desert. We're dying. Just bring us back to Egypt. And, and Moses goes to God like, oh, these people you gave me, God, what am I going to do? They're complaining about food. And God graciously provides this manna, some substance. Uh, Sienna, when we were getting the matzah bread, which we're using over Lent, uh, I was just kind of explaining it to her, and then we were going to go get some. And uh, she said, oh, it's like a cracker, like manna. And I was like, that's a great question. I have no idea what that thing looked like. I picture little soft flakes coming down from the sky, but reality is, we've never seen manna. It was God's unique provision for Israel in the desert. And in any case, for 40 years, God's providing manna for his people. And uh, to represent God's provision uh, for the people, Aaron took some of the manna, put it in a, a golden cup, and put it in the ark, along with his staff and the Ten Commandments. And the idea of hidden manna is almost like that Jesus will open up the resources that the manna represent in that ark, that God himself will provide what his church needs. That it may not be provision like we think of it, but it will be good because it will be from God. That the hidden manna, I think, is just kind of the doorway into seeing God will provide for his church. And God will provide for Pergamum even in their difficult situation, for those who overcome, I will sustain you. Don't forget about the manna experience in the desert. And then the the white stone. Um, I'm not going to give you, I found seven different explanations for this white stone that uh, the scholars all were like, these are all legitimate options. I'm just going to give you one. And before God, um, I always try to be honest with you. I am not sure that this is actually what it means. But it's the one, at least my heart resonated with the most, that just kind of made real sense to me. Um, That the white stone, when you would go to a festival in Pergamon, it was almost guaranteed that this festival would be like a large barbecue, celebratory, a great, wonderful time. But on the grill, always, was the sacrificed animal. So at the temple, you may give some hair from the animal. Uh, you may give a piece of the animal at the temple to whatever god they're worshiping. To dedicate the animal to that god and that worship experience. And then the invitation has gone out. Hey, come celebrate the God of so-and-so with us. We're going to have a big feast. We're going to uh, sacrifice our animal. But we get to eat the meat, come and party and celebrate. In order to get into that celebratory festival, your entrance ticket was a white stone with your name on it. It allows like your special invite to the feast, a white stone that had... Your name scratched on it. So when you got to the feast, worshiping this God, lots of meat, you'd come, kind of flip your stone around. I don't know how big this thing was. Show your ticket uh, to the local bouncer, and the bouncer would be like, all right, you're in. Good. Come on in. If you didn't have the white stone, nope, you don't get to, to party with us. If that's the interpretation of what, what this white stone is, just brings like this joy, right? Of Jesus saying, you don't need to go to those festivals. You don't need an entrance to worship some deity because I've got the party for all eternity in store for you. I've got a banquet above all other banquets. And I'm going to give you your own entrance tickets. It'll have a name, but it'll be a new name 
Because the name of Jesus is going to be inscribed right on that stone. So that when you show up, you've got your pass. Because I love you. But whatever the interpretation is, can I just say this, if I'm honest with you? Whatever they are. If it's from God, it's good. Right? If it's coming from God... We may have these interpretations completely messed up, and yet, on that day, for the church in Pergamum, those who overcome are going to be kind of like this. Wow! Thank you, Jesus! And so I don't need to get it accurate. I hope I do. I I read a lot to try to get it. But even if I miss the mark, I'm still in that posture of, all right, I got that wrong. That's even better. Thank you, Lord. For those who overcome. Alright, so so that's a lot more than we typically have to do in the background section. And I want to see if we can kind of drop into our discernment here, guys. So what do you think? For FCCB. I mean, we can all probably agree on this point. We're, We're not forced to know if we're going to cling to the name of Jesus in the face of death. Right? I haven't been there. I don't think I've heard any stories from our church anywhere that I would say, wow, you were faithful to Jesus in the face of death. There could be some that that I missed at at some point, but, but I don't think they're sitting here in the pews. I don't think that's our commendation like Antipas or the others in the church of Pergamum. But I do think there's a connection point for us to hear Jesus' encouragement in this. Some of you, although it's not your life, some of you have paid quite a high price to claim the name of Jesus. I have heard those stories. I've heard some of us Speak about the pain. Speak about um, the, the incredible prayers and struggle because your family has pushed you away and no longer is going to spend significant time with you or trust you with your grandkids. Because you're part of Jesus' people. And I've shared some of those tears with you. And I want to say, there are others, perhaps not all of us, and I, I'm not interested in forcing FCCB like into this Pergamum position. I'm not interested in that. But I am interested in offering Jesus' encouragement to us as a church. I have seen you walk faithful before the Lord, even in life's difficulties that have come to you simply because you claim Jesus' name. I have seen that. And you know what? Jesus knows where you live. And Jesus knows all the names of the people that have been affected by that. And Jesus himself breathes encouragement into your life in those moments because they do not go unnoticed by him. There are stances that we as a church together, corporately, have taken that creates friction. And uh, I don't need to go through them all. But there are places that we together will never veer off, no matter the cost. It's just been a small cost for us so far. But when that cost increases over time, which it will... I believe Jesus will find FCCB clinging to his name faithfully, despite whatever cost is out there. And I want to say, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of 260 some odd years? Are you kidding me? Preaching Jesus, being faithful to Jesus, holding the gospel. That's crazy, guys. I don't know how many churches are older than FCCB. 
Bruce and Holly, maybe someday you can find out how many churches in this area or even in America are older than FCCB because I'm curious. I suspect we're in the top 100, which is pretty stellar, right? Because I bet if you look at the other 99, if that truly is the case, there's very few who have remained faithful to Jesus over the years. Well done. Well done holding on. However, the back half of Jesus' message to Pergamum, that Jesus has a few things against them, does he have a few things against us? Are there things slipping in the back door as we fight our battles and we're faithful and we're holding on and we will not give up the sanctity of life? We will not give up uh, clinging to the gospel. We will remain fired up for these things. Is there anything slipping in our back door? And I think there might be. As far as I can tell, there are three gods that are worshipped around us. Uh, I'm sure there's many more, but there seem to be three uh, obvious. The gods of our culture are sexuality, materialism, and diversity. If I have that right, if those are the gods that are being worshipped out there, sexuality, materialism, um, and uh, diversity. Are any of those slipping in the back door through Balaamite kind of teaching where it's like, oh, no, it's okay. Uh, you can do that. That won't hurt. Jesus forgives. We're good. Don't worry about it. Might be. I want to be as frank as I can. Uh, without parking too long. These candles are burning. (laughs) There are people at FCCB, and I say this out of grace, actually, and compassion, not judgment. Please know that. There are people at FCCB who have written off a troublesome addiction to pornography because you don't think there's victory for you, and because Jesus forgives anyway. And I can't help but think that's something that Jesus notices. The cavalierness to a sin that hurts our soul and brings us away from the Lord, and to treat the cross of Jesus with such levity. I can go about my life seeking sexual pleasure and Jesus is going to forgive anyway. I think some of that is present with us guys. And that's just me being honest, but also compassionate. Don't give up the battle. You know what pleases the Lord. He will equip you and free you. Don't give it up and listen to the Balaamite saying, don't worry about it. Not a big deal. Second one, materialism. Um, I swim in a material world. I'm not a material girl, but I am a material boy. Um, Because materialism in America is literally the air we breathe, the water we swim in. I can't tell whether or not this is one of the gods that we're like, yeah, it's it's fine. Don't worry about what you spend at Amazon. It's just 20 bucks here, 20 bucks there. It doesn't really matter about our finances as long as I have a retirement. And It's the air I breathe too. And I find myself like, Lord, is this a word for us? Because I can't tell. I can't see it. But of all of these, Perhaps this is the one that although I can't see it because it's so hard to reflect, I think there's something in my heart, and maybe something in our heart, that needs to own that thing. Say, God, help us. Let us live differently than those around us. God, free us. Help me repent to turn towards something new. Being honest with you, that if I had clarity on what that meant, 
I would verbalize it, whether you'd agree with it or not. I don't have clarity on it. But man, it feels like that's part of our vibe. Not that we're extravagant. I give that to us. Okay? Last one, diversity. Let me say this. Um, I love diversity with people. I love it, love it, love it, love it. We uh, traditionally have gone down to Boston as much as possible as a family because I need some diversity. All right? Um, someone was asking me actually this week what my church was like. I was like, well, generationally, I guess we're, we have some diversity, but we're all white, except for Ida and my wife. Other than that, we're all white. And in Boston, I literally value hearing someone speak another language I can't understand. I'm like, that's awesome. That's cool. Uh, my wife, uh, part of that is connection to her culture, her Hispanic, Puerto Rican culture that she's trying to pass on to her kids to some level. We need diversity for that. I love diversity. I love being with people who don't agree with me and dialoguing with them. I love diversity, Okay. I can't make that any clearer. I love diversity. And yet we worship diversity to the point that when the church makes a proclamation from God's word that, yes, I love diversity. But God has given us one way to the Father. All of a sudden, I get the kickback, right? Ah, you're just a... Western, elitist, Christian man with that uh, gospel that just looks down on everyone else. And uh, you don't value diversity because every pathway to God is the same pathway to God. And you would know that if you valued diversity. And I hold on to, to Scripture and say, no, I love diversity with people, but I don't confuse diversity with truth. Okay? But some of us do. Some of us at FCCB, in that push for acceptance, in that push for diversity, we think we have to subject the truth to it. And we don't. We can love others, radically different people, and not let go of the truth that God has given us one way to the Father, and His name is Jesus. And in the back door is some pressure, I think, that some of us have given into. So here we are, a little outpost church proclaiming victory and good news, uh, but we need to help each other navigate this life together because the temptations are there. So I want to share this directional statement, if we have that available. Uh, This is what your elders shared at a meal. Uh, This is moving us and guiding us on our way forward. Because Jesus is Lord of all, we will encourage and train one another biblically to follow Jesus in our whole life so that God is glorified. Meaning, you need help. I need help. We need each other. These things coming in the back door are hard because these things out here are really hard to battle. And we need each other kind of watching our back to help us navigate through life faithfully. Uh, This is becoming a dominant uh, sentence for your elders uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, We are getting our small group leaders together. Uh, I've got the beginning of a list. Bonnie's going to give me some more information. If you lead a small group, we are likely very aware of it, and we are likely uh, ready to contact you. But please see one of the elders, Bruce, Bruce, or me, um, and let us know, hey, don't forget, I, I have a group of people I connect with, because we don't want to miss anyone who's leading a small group as we uh, continue pushing some of these ideas out. All right. I want to love you enough that you and I get the prize. Like, I, I want FCCB to get some hidden manna. Whatever that is, I want it. I want FCCB to be wearing this like white stone so that whether it's an entrance or whatever the white stone is, I want it for us. So we need to help each other along the way. But we're going to invite us up to communion. Um, 
uh, after I pray, our worship team will come forward. I see the kids. I know I went long today. Um, you somewhat have my apologies. I don't like going long, but today seemed like maybe it needed it. Uh, so Bruce or uh, anyone back there, if you can just have the kids join us as we kind of move into communion and song, that'd be great. Um, so if our worship leaders can uh, come forward, and uh, I'll bring us in prayer. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you love your church so deeply. You know our ins and outs. You know our sins and weaknesses. You know the successes to celebrate. And God, we are so thankful that you speak to your people. God, I thank you for your commendation for FCCB. You've seen each of our days all these years. You've seen us walk faithfully before you. But you've also seen us open ourselves to some teaching that has enticed us. So God, we repent before you as a church. We give you permission to identify in us areas that we need your help. And may you strengthen us for the journey that you have ahead of us. May you restore your people by your table. In Jesus' name, amen.